We are back another week with another Greg Hand segment of Unearthing Cincinnati's Past. Greg, what do you have for us this week? Oh, we're going to talk about dime museums. All right. What are dime museums? Dime museums filled a really important evolutionary step between circuses and vaudeville. Okay. Okay. Now, of course, vaudeville um, is, is kind of the origins of musical theater and, and that sort of thing. So in this evolution, um, the circuses, which traveled around, around the country, used to carry with them a couple of kinds of acts. They, they would have animal acts mm -hmm. uh, where they would just have wild animals. You know, circus would have uh, lions, tigers, bears, elephants, oh my. Uh, that sort of thing. They would, have, they would have acts of some skill, so horse riding acts, that sort of thing. They would have comedy, uh, clowns, and, uh, and that sort of thing. And um, uh, they would have with them a freak show. And this was quite common for circuses to have a special section uh, just for freaks. And the mm. freak show was usually in a separate tent. You'd have the big top where all the other acts would go in. And then, then you'd have uh, this tent off to, to the side. And it was usually pretty poorly lit because a lot of the things in the freak show were in fact fake. You know, oh, okay. You would have, you would have uh, a, a setup and, and you might have um, a hole where somebody could stick their head out of a costume that, uh, mm -hmm. that, that had a particular appearance or, um, or uh, uh, for a while, Barnum, P.T. Barnum displayed something he called the Fiji mermaid. And what the Fiji mermaid was, was it was the top half of a monkey sewed onto the bottom half of a fish. Um, okay. and, and had it stuffed and he, he would display things like that. So there would be this, this, this fake stuff there. Well, the um, uh, circuses um, after a while decided to go a little more upscale. And so uh, there was a lot of talent coming into the circuses. People wanted to bring their families. The circus owners realized that if, uh, if you could bring your families in, uh, you could sell a lot more tickets than you could if it was just an adult male audience. And so they went, um, they build themselves as sanitary shows. They build themselves as moral shows. And there wasn't any moral and they weren't doing any religious preaching or anything. That was yeah. just the code word to indicate that we don't have uh, hoochie coochie dancers <laughs> and we don't well, have well, family we don't have freak shows yeah you know? and so the freaks and the hooch dancers had to go someplace mm -hmm. now kind of coming in from the side is this whole idea of museums and um, Cincinnati had a museum very early uh, in its history the the um, uh, University of Cincinnati, for example, was founded in 1819, which is just um, uh, 30 years or so after the city itself was founded. Mm. And at about the same time, the Western Museum was founded in the same building. And so uh, down on... Uh, Walnut Street near 4th, there was uh, this building and it included the classes for uh, the Cincinnati College, which was the institution that later became UC. And okay. there was also the Western Museum. And the Western Museum had some very talented people. John James Audubon, who's famous for his paintings of birds, uh, spent a year in the employment of the Western Museum as a um, a taxidermist, um, uh, stuffing and preserving animals and birds mm -hmm. to go on display uh, in this museum. Uh, Dr. Daniel Drake, who was really kind of the founder of the medical community in Cincinnati, mm -hmm. had a lot of natural history 
specimens, uh, fossils, minerals, that sort of thing that were put on display in the Western Museum. However, people did not pay, and it, it was a private enterprise, it wasn't a public museum, you had to pay for admission. People didn't pay to go in and see the fossils and the minerals. Yeah. Uh, they paid because in addition to those things, the Western Museum would put on these wax tableaus. They, they, would, they would have sculptors uh, create, recreate actually, the horrors of hell, Dante's Inferno. Okay. Was, was, was rebuilt in colored wax uh, in the basement of the Western Museum. And so people would, would, right. would pay to go see these horrible- They would probably things. pay to go see that too. Yeah. The, um, they, they had um, uh, the three witches scene from Macbeth recreated as wax, life-size wax uh, sculptures. You know, so those were the kinds of things that, that people paid to see uh, at the museum. Um, they would also have demonstrations of things that, that were quite uncommon. So in the 1820s, 1830s, nobody knew what electricity was. And so they would have exhibits where you could come in and get shocked <laughs> with electricity and, and you'd, you'd pay to get shocked. Because, oh, because how else are you going to experience electricity unless unless you go out in a thunderstorm you know yeah um laughing gas was a big hit at the western museum they <laughs> they they would give a, a a lecture on laughing gas and then they'd pass around samples and and your ancestors here in cincinnati are getting high from nitrous <laughs> at oxide. the museum at the museum right <laughs> and so and so uh, the idea of a museum in the 1800s was far less educational mm. uh, than we think of it today. So you've got, got this confluence with, with circus uh, acts coming this way and museums coming this way. And it led in Cincinnati to Middleton's, Middleton's Dime Museum, which was a four-story building located at the south um, east corner of 6th and Vine Street. I, th I think there's a Panera Bread outlet there. It's, it's nice. just on the periphery. It hasn't changed much. Yeah, just on the periphery of Fountain Square. Yeah. And so uh, in this building, in Middleton's Dime Museum, there was a, a large theater, uh, Every dime museum in the country had, had a large theater because they did put on acts. But in addition to the large theater, every room, and there were usually two big rooms on each floor, every room had a stage off in the corner and you'd have smaller acts uh, at, on, on these stages. And so the, um, the, uh, the dime museums, just had this constant rotating um, repertoire of all sorts of strange and wonderful things. Yeah. Now, now these these rooms would be filled with with permanent exhibits. So they would have um, like two headed cows would be would be on exhibit, right. or they would have a mad stone uh, exhibited. You know what a mad stone is? I don't. So if 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 uh, if you if you are familiar with butchering yeah. uh, cattle or uh, deer, like during deer season, I dabble. Uh, every once in a while, in their stomachs, you get this this stone. It's basically congealed hair uh, oh, okay. that's been cemented together, and they were called mad stones because the belief was that they could cure rabies. That if you were bit by a mad dog, you would find somebody with a mad stone and place the stone on the dog bite and it would, it would adhere, it would stick to the dog bite until uh, the poison was filled up or it was filled up with poison and then it would fall off, you know? So they would have things like that. So is there any truth to that? 
Is they what? Is, is there any truth to that being no. rape? Okay. No, they, they swore by it though. And, and uh, uh, Cincinnati had a couple of quite famous madstones. There was one in, uh, in uh, Sadamsville mm -hmm. that people from as far away as Illinois would, would, would take the train uh, to Cincinnati to, to have this madstone. One in Boone wow. County as well. And I, I, I think uh, the two-headed calf and a madstone are still on display at the Beringer Crawford Museum yeah. over there in, in, in Davu Park. So they'd have things like that. Mm -hmm. and, and then they'd have um, art on display. Uh, the art tended to be uh, risque. You know? okay. So, so uh, mythological uh, goddesses mm -hmm. uh, with, um, with uh, uh, cherubs, and draperies and not much in the way of clothing right right um would 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 be there and um oh uh uh inventions uh, you, you mm -hmm. you'd have different nice. sorts of uh of hometown inventions that would be be on display um but then in the corners you'd uh, of of the display rooms you would have little stages and there's a very interesting report by a guy who spent a uh, part of his younger days uh, traveling around the country with a particular talent he had, and that is um, he could spell any word backward that that you spoke to him. So if you if if you started speaking to him, he would start writing on the back uh, blackboard, writing every word that you said backwards. Backwards. Wow. You know, and that's the kind of stuff that would be on these small stages uh, or, um, or, or the fat lady. Uh, and and, and the, the fat lady, you couldn't just have uh, some poor unfortunate woman with a glandular condition <laughs> uh, weighing 400 pounds. There always had to be a backstory. So, yeah. so, so uh, the, the, the fat lady was always a princess uh, or a duchess, or something like that, and and uh, brought over from Luxembourg or or any place, and put on display in the Dime Museum, where uh, you know she would not speak English because, of course, she came from this right Pottsylvania or wherever, uh, and actually it would just be some some poor woman they found in a shack in Kentucky. Uh, <laughs> I had a glandular problem. Yeah. How would you like to get paid to be a freak? Uh, and then, but on on the main stage, you mm -hmm. would have you would have the uh, the really really amazing things. So, um, at one time, Tem uh, Middleton's Dime Museum had a convention of tattooed people. Okay. And so they had uh, thirty to forty um, people with basically whole body tattoos wow. um, and they, they would, you know, just standing there on stage was kind of boring. So they'd bring in an orchestra and these tattooed people would dance, nice. uh, dance the waltz and the quadrille and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, they would have um, cowboys, cowboys and Indians. Uh, you know, this, this is 1870s, 1880s. Uh, people are hearing about things going on in the Wild West. Ah. But, um, by 1870, Cincinnati, which at, at one time was thought of as the Wild West, uh, was no longer the Wild West. And so they would actually hire cowboys to come in and do rope tricks and, and, and that sort of thing on the stage. Right. Exactly. There's, there's no, no way else that they could have seen it back in the late 1800s. Right. You know, I mean, the, the trains weren't yet running out there. Yeah. You know, if you wanted to hop on a wagon train or something and put yourself in harm's way, you could see the cowboys. But but this was a way way to see it. And interestingly enough, um, Karl Marx's daughter mm -hmm. um, came to Cincinnati and somebody took her to the Dime Museum when, when the cowboys were on exhibit. And uh, the cowboys allegedly told her that um, 
while Americans thought of cowboys as being free spirits and an example of, of freedom in America, that they were actually oppressed workers and, and, okay. that they were all, and that they were all in favor of her father's ideas about communisms. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. Uh, the, um, the, by, by this point, of course, uh, most of the American Indians, most of the Native Americans are being confined to reservations. Mm. And um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs was constantly underfunded, you know, so the yeah. uh, National Bureau of Indian Affairs was in charge of all of these Native Americans who had uh, who had been defeated and who were confined on reservations that were located in areas where there was terrible hunting and you couldn't do any farming and yeah. it was just an awful existence and the bureau didn't have a lot of money so what they did is they rented out indians and you you could get in touch with the bureau of indian affairs and say you know i'd i'd like i'd like 10 or 12 sioux to come to Cincinnati and we're going to put them up on the stage at the dime museum and they, they would do their authentic. Yeah. Do, do the war dance and uh, smoke a peace pipe and, and wow. that sort of thing. Maybe uh, get into uh, a mock shootout with a couple of cowboys and, uh, and that sort of thing. And, yeah. and, 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 and so that, that was some of the stuff that you would watch there. Now to really bring, people in, uh, you know, you, you kind of knew that you were going to find bizarre stuff at, at the Dime Museum, but to give it that extra kick and to bring more people in, mm -hmm. Dime Museums uh, were instantly recognizable because they were covered, the entire facade of the Dime Museum was covered in canvas posters uh, that were usually painted in a workshop up on the top floor of the Dime Museum. And they hired a number of very, very good artists to, to do these posters. And so you would have Jojo the dog face boy, um, who was, who was right. a real person with, with a condition where he grew hair uh, oh. completely over every inch of his body. Um, and you'd have a, 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 a 20 foot tall poster of sure. Jojo the dog Go face Joe. boy hanging wow. outside uh, the window, or or um, uh, another one would be the pumpkin head, uh, you know, somebody with uh, hydrocephaly, uh, where where their skull was expanded out. Mm -hmm. uh, you'd have paintings of this hanging outside uh, the Dime Museum, and it turns out that that for about five or six years the artist for Cincinnati's Dime Museum was a guy named Windsor McKay. Okay. Windsor, Windsor McKay later went on to become quite famous. Uh, he created a comic strip called Little Nemo in Slumberland that is, is quite beautiful, hmm. uh, very psychedelic. It, it sounds, it, it, you know, it did pretty much what, what the title says, a little boy would fall asleep and then he'd have these very strange dreams. And then at the last panel, he would wake up by falling out of bed. Um, Windsor McKay also is credited with being one of the very earliest uh, creators of animated cartoons. He did a, nice. uh, an animated cartoon called Gertie the Dinosaur, uh, where this dinosaur kind of walks into the into the picture frame and chews up trees and swallows them and picks up rocks and throws them away and and has a fight with a caveman and uh, you know not much in the way of plot but nobody had ever seen art I'm not before, yeah before and so McKay would uh, develop his artwork uh, as a painter of these posters now um, one of his contemporaries said that it, he should have been an act at the Dime Museum because of the way he painted. You know, most uh, artists who work start out with some sketches and they get the rough shape of something and then they start uh, Add more putting in more, and more detail. Yeah. And what McKay would do 
is he would sit there and freehand draw the outline of every figure he was going to include, then do the background, and then fill in those outlines that he had drawn freehand. Mm. You know? So very interesting, uh, interesting character. The um, the Dime Museum in Cincinnati was um, part of a franchise. It, it was uh, it was actually owned by a company out of Chicago. And so okay. in Chicago, there were two or three dime museums, each one owned by a different company. And one of them uh, owned the dime museum in Cincinnati. And I think, I think there was one in Lexington or Louisville that was also, also part of that chain. And so the ax would kind of uh, rotate back and forth. And each dime museum was kind of um, responsible for digging up local talent. So uh, Cincinnati's Dime Museum introduced a character called the What's It. And What's the idea it? was that this is some uh, creature captured wild in Afghanistan mm. uh, who uh, can crack uh, beef bones with his, his bare teeth. And it turns out that um, it was, in fact, a... Uh, railroad worker from the West End mm -hmm. uh, that, that somebody had, had, had discovered. He had kind of a bar bet trick that he did where he would have a pre-broken bone uh -huh. and he'd go into the bar and say, you know, I bet you a drink, I can snap this bone <laughs> and would bite into the pre-broken broken bone. So they decided, well, you know, instead of feeding him drinks, we'll feed him 10 bucks a night and he can buy all the drinks he want and we'll just put him in a uh, rabbit skin loincloth and <laughs> give people think that he's a wild man from Afghanistan but actually we found wow. him a block and a half railroad ago. worker that's yeah <laughs> interesting so um so yeah the um uh, another another big uh, big thing. This was the era of newspapers, you know. So Cincinnati um, at this time would have had nine or ten daily newspapers. Okay. Um, and so uh, Cincinnati was a big printing town, and uh, back then linotype machines were uh, were just coming in. If you wanted to print something, you had to do it in monotype, where you had to pick each piece of type. Uh, off of a rack and put it in oh in wow a stick and so they would have typesetting competitions that would last for days you would bring in a series of typesetters and give them a book and say you know okay how many pages can you get into this and hours later they'd come back and check well you know this guy's typeset 32 pages and this guy's only done 28 and so I, that is so much manual work yeah can you imagine? You know? Wow. No, I, can't, I cannot imagine that. Even in college, I would write papers by doing voice to text. And I would just oh, have yeah, there. a screen up there. <laughs> and I would just talk, like go through my outline. And it would just, <laughs> I would get mad if, if it guessed the wrong word. I was like, yeah. I can say that. Oh, wow. What a waste of my time. <laughs> now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Since you got to consider the environment, this is this is like 1870s into the 1890s. I I, I don't think the Dime Museum survived 1895, mm. um, but for about a 25 year period, 1870 to about 1895, this thing existed. So if you're going to go on a date, you know you couldn't go to the movie theater. Yeah, you, know, you couldn't you couldn't do Netflix and chill. Uh, you you <laughs> the late 1800s. Yeah, uh, women who showed up in bars were assumed to be professionals, mm. you know. So uh, theaters were um, were kind of unsavory at the time. Mm. Um, actresses were considered little more than prostitutes, and um, actual prostitutes. There were so many of them that they usually reserved the third gallery in theaters uh, for prostitutes to uh, carry on their business because wow. so much of it was transacted in theaters. And so there just really weren't a lot of places that, that you could take a date. 
uh, mm. that was considered somewhat respectable uh, in the city. You know, of course, you know, you could take her to church, um, that sort of thing. Um, maybe the art museum, but that was only open during the day. And yeah. Uh, and so Good the birthday, Dime Museum please. kind of got this reputation as a dating place. And the, um, in fact, it was not only um, considered a safe place to take a date, you know, take, be, because, um, you know, you'd, you'd take a, a young lady through the exhibits and know, you know, that really scary one's right around the corner and she's going to jump into my arm. Ah, there you go. You know, that kind of thing. Like a, a scary but, movie of the time. Yeah, but it was considered uh, kind of like the Tinder of that time period because women would go uh, unaccompanied or they, women would go in pairs yeah. to the Dime Museum because this was, a, this was a place to meet men. And so uh, within the et entertainment environment at the time, it provided an environment where there was a lot of romance uh, going on in the middle of a freak show. Interesting. Yeah, it's kind of like opposite ends there. That's yeah, that's kind of cool. That's so pretty that, cool. That's the that the the dime dime museum and chill was the late dime, mu dime museum and chill. There you go. <laughs> well, freak <laughs> chill and chill. That's what we're doing on Saturday night. Yeah, the um, they uh, uh, you, you could tell that it was a respectable place because they didn't serve alcoholic beverages. Uh, and they didn't serve cigars. Mm. Um, you know that 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 was the sign. Uh, those those were signs that you were in, um, you know, questionable nice. territory, right? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, at the theater, um, uh, theaters were so afraid of fire, uh, you know, that uh, uh, there were some theaters that made you check your cigars when you came in. Check your cigar, so like a yes. coach. Check. So you would like, you, you you would hand over your cigar to a guy at, in the ticket booth, and he'd put it on a shelf with a tag number, you know, so you could come back and. So you just make sure you hope you get the right one. I guess that's right. You <laughs> <laughs> just throw them in a box. I, there's a cigar. Just take whichever one off the top. Yeah, nightlife nightlife in Cincinnati was considerably different back in the 1880s than we could ever imagine it today. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So where else could you go if you didn't go to the Dime Museum? Where, where was another place that you could, you could meet? Right, exactly. There's nothing else, right? There just, there just weren't those sorts of, uh, those sorts of situations Church? for a reasonable price, you know? A, yeah. a, a dime was, uh, was not insignificant uh, back then. This, this yeah. would have been... This would have been, you know, it's not too much of an exaggeration to say that during this time period, a dime would be very close to a seven to ten dollar admission. Okay. So it's a, it's a movie ticket today. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, if you were trying to go there like every weekend or right. to try to meet people or whatever, that that can uh, start to get pretty expensive. Right. Wow. Wow. So JoJo the dog face boy. You said that yeah, he, Joe, he he actually came to Cincinnati. He, he was actually like, oh, came oh. to Cincinnati. the 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 record uh, in Cincinnati is is quite considerable. Uh, Jojo the dog face boy was here, and any number of of fat women all trying to outdo themselves. Mm -hmm. A um, a Chinese midget um, uh, returned here several times uh yeah. this this uh, uh full-grown man but he was uh, uh less than um, two and a half feet tall wow and, uh would would uh would come in occasionally the um uh oh the uh human alligator um human alligator in, again the, the, you know Today we we take people like this to the hospital. I mean, basically, <laughs> this was somebody that had almost terminal psoriasis or something. Yeah. But but they would uh, they would go on exhibit as the the alligator man. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think we could do these things now. <laughs> no. The uh, 
the the it it another it, it's another of one of those examples where there's kind of an element of sadism yeah <laughs> is, you know that it uh, uh you you really just don't treat people this way anymore right but uh but it did play its role and and as i said as it started fading out that's when you started getting into vaudeville and so mm. some of these acts that uh used to take place on the um, dime museum stage moved out into legitimate theaters and yeah. so they, they yeah. would announce uh, they would announce things like uh, a guy who can talk backwards mm -hmm. and you know trick acts like that and those started working their way into what had been just like musical reviews or mm -hmm. minstrel shows. Cincinnati had lots of minstrel shows with with uh, everybody in blackface uh, on, on on the stage. So you'd intersperse these sort of freak acts yeah. or extraordinary dime museum acts into uh, more of these performing yeah, arts the theater performance, type, right. type pieces. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you but you would probably have to get the you'd get the prostitutes out of the third. <laughs> level well and, and what what you would do <laughs> what you would do you you did indeed uh, <laughs> by this point get the prostitutes out of the third tier um but you started well, moving them on the, stage the, because the of the entire because, uh vaudeville led of course into burlesque and burlesque led into the strip shows you know there you go see it all started <laughs> so, so it all it all kind of feeds yeah Wow. Wow. Yeah. So that lasted. So the Dime Museum lasted for for uh, how many years? I, I'd say I'd say it's strong. Uh, strong period would have been about 25 years, 1870 okay. to about 1895. And, and then, in those 25 years, there wasn't any inflation. They never went up to the three nickel no, was, museum or the quarter museum or they, as, as far as I know, their their admission was a dime throughout the whole period. Yeah, because that was the first thing I thought of. Like calling it a dime museum is great, but then what yeah. happens if you have to start charging more? Right. You can't be like, <laughs> yeah, like the uh, um, all the dollar stores are now five dollar stores. You exactly. Know, and the, yeah. Now it's just like everything is an increment of a dollar, and that's like that's not what you. That's not what you said it was. You said it's yeah. a dollar store. No, but it. Uh, I, I I get the impression that it was about a dime throughout the whole period. Interesting. Interesting. Very nice. Cincinnati's longest running freak show. <laughs> All right. Uh, anything else to uh, to add for the Cincinnati Dime Museum here? I think that's uh, you got the meat of it. Got the meat of it. <laughs> got the got the dog face. Got the <laughs> that was the start of theater and strip shows and everything right there in Cincinnati. It was very influential. Very, very influential. That's right. All right. Awesome. Uh, thank you for joining here for another week. Uh, this again is Greg Hand. Go follow him at Cincinnati Curiosities. Um, he's posting every day. He'll, he'll post uh, a little bit more about this. You said you have a, a postcard um, and some other things for um, Jojo the dog face boy yep. and some other things. So we'll share those and then you can uh, uh, follow those with Greg Hand, and we will have you back on here on the 3 a.m. Coney uh, next week. Thank you again. You got it.